Hello and welcome to the Pastor Mike Drop Podcast. I'm your host, Surfer Dude. Uh, we are we're in the middle of vacation Bible school here at Lutheran Church of Hope. And Emily, it's your fault. You're in charge of all of it. <laughs> <I'm my laughs> what fault. have you done to us? Yeah, well, I put you in costumes. Yeah, and yeah. We've got a good looking crew today. You definitely had. We mm-hmm. are joined today by Yes, Pastor Jeremy Johnson, who's Sheldon. Sheldon, yeah. Yes, and Chaplain Anna Eckley. What is your VBS title? Lifeguard Anna. Yeah, oh, as yeah. evidence by yes. all the lifeguard gear. In today's skit, Anna was really kind of letting the rock stars have it, which they needed. Yeah. They, they yeah. did. It was an admonishment of the Lord. Yeah. It was. It was a. It was a guiding yeah. kind of word. Musicians. Yeah. Musicians, <laughs> Ugh, right? Yeah, we love musicians. Just to clarify, yeah. Pastor Mike Drop Podcast officially loves musicians. Uh, mm-hmm. And Jeremy, you got to give us just a little bit of your Sheldon voice. <laughs> and according to my calculations, I, I probably shouldn't be doing this in front of thousands of people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the thing is, is if you're a part of the Hope community, and a lot of our podcast <laughs> listeners are, this makes sense. Because you're like, well, yeah, we know it's VBS time. And if you're a part of the large group of people who listen to this podcast all over the world, you're like, what is going on in that church? Have they finally lost it? <laughs> yeah, they have. But there's a passage in scripture that says we become fools for Christ. Yeah. And so it is, it is biblical. Um, our theme this year is Hope Island VBS, and we're inviting kids to experience paradise on earth and mm-hmm. a glimpse of heaven, a glimpses of heaven. And it has been remarkable. We Maybe we'll talk a little bit about it as we go, just as you know, metaphors and examples. But it's been great. Uh, that said, we got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, as we're reading through the whole Holy Bible together as a church family, and we are up to 2 Corinthians and the old, in the New Testament, and if you're doing the whole Holy Bible readings, we're covering uh, Psalms 51 uh, through 75 as well. So mm-hmm. got some questions on those that we've received uh, that I've heard from you, and, and we shape them into the questions for this podcast. And feel free to um, send your questions in live if you're watching live, and uh, we'll get to as many of those as we can as we go. But um, Ted Lasso, if you would, please help us out. Why don't we just jump right in? Anybody got any questions? Oh, yeah. No, should have saw that coming. Okay. First question. Is there a positive side to suffering? Yeah. Uh, the second- On that cheery note, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we go from, <laughs> kind of a whoa, it's a Jesus party to, <laughs> yeah. tell us if there's a positive yeah. side to suffering, just like Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh. Right. So to, so to start us bringing us down, no, uh, Paul, it, right away in 2 Corinthians, verse 4, Paul says that... Uh, he says, if I can find it now, I need, I need bifocals. He comforts us in all yeah. our troubles. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort others yep. when they are troubled. And we'll be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. There's this reality that like, God doesn't cause it, but God will use it. And so mm-hmm. Paul is saying, like, I, I, and, and we don't know exactly what it was that Paul was dealing with, but there was something that he was dealing with. And God comforted the, the, the truth of the gospel, comforted him. So he's able to come to the church in Corinth, and he's able to come alongside of them. And I think about that in all of our lives, that mm-hmm. when you've experienced something and now you're on that, that side of the proverbial table, you're able to come alongside somebody who's experiencing that same thing in a very different way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think probably all of us, many people have experienced that to say, man, I would never want to have to go through that experience again, but I believe that God can, can use me to comfort others. And we have this ministry around hope called one-to-one care. Mm-hmm. And people mm-hmm. who've, and I think like some of it is people who've lost uh, a spouse to cancer or uh, people who've lost a child. And they have a unique experience that you, you can't really speak into if you've never gone through it. And so mm-hmm. they, they say, you know what, I'm willing to use my experience and to come alongside people who are going through the same thing. That's not just some clever thing we came up with as a church. That's biblical. That's what Paul's saying right here to the church in Corinth. God comforted me, and so now I'm going to come alongside and I'm going to comfort you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That you you mentioned it, Pastor Jeremy, that uh, Paul has been suffering, and he doesn't get into details specifically as to what that suffering is. But uh, we know that he's not just talking about this theoretically. And I think we all we all sense that. I mean, Anna, you're serving as a chaplain now mm-hmm. here at Hope in addition to some other duties. Uh, but nobody can talk to somebody who's going through something like somebody who's been through it. That doesn't mean those of us, you know, there's certain things mm-hmm. I've never experienced. It doesn't mean that God can't be helpful to one of our listeners who hasn't gone through a particular difficult time in life with somebody who's going through that specific thing. But there are times when, you know, somebody who has a particular type of cancer and then there's a survivor mm-hmm. of somebody in our church family of that particular type of cancer. And so there is a positive t- side to suffering. 
God comforts us so we can comfort others. Right. Which in the Lutheran church is part of our funeral liturgy. You know, we, mm-hmm. we say it right off the bat at the beginning of the service. God comforts us so we can comfort others. And I think that's a powerful word. Mm-hmm. And whether you have a faith or not, whether you're a Christian or not, everyone is going to experience suffering. It's yes. like a very natural part mm-hmm. of life. So it's having a faith is what makes us different and what makes us uh, kind of stand out in our suffering because we have this eternal hope yeah. that our suffering will one day be redeemed into total joy and total worship. Mm -hmm. Which is another positive side of suffering, but I'm also glad that you brought that up just to say the statement, because there are pockets of Christianity that don't believe that the truly faithful are going to suffer. Well, explain Paul to me then, who, who is not in his you know, persecution mode where he's trying to destroy Christianity. He's in his fully converted mode where he is the greatest in terms of most effective missionary in the first century. And he's suffering. He's still, he's going to talk about it later as a thorn in his side. Um, And again, you never get specific into the details. We can only guess. But we also know that um, Paul is saying, look, I'm not just talking about this as some sort of theoretical thing. I'm talking about this as somebody who's been through it. I've been through this, and I'm telling you, God uses this for good. Um, and he's one other thing that I think is worth noting here on suffering, a positive side of suffering for any devoted follower of Jesus. If you're suffering because of your faith, and sometimes we get we we do get pushed for our faith, or we get left out, or you know, in extreme cases around the world, you get persecuted, oppressed, imprisoned, executed. Paul's saying, "Yeah, that's me," and he's going to be executed for his faith eventually. And he's saying very clearly, it's worth it. Mm-hmm. It's Jesus is worth the pain, mm-hmm. which is a very bold testimony. I mean, that, that is humbling to me. It's like, huh, yeah. The, the little we have, the, well, we get pushback. We're, we're public pastors in a very public mm-hmm. church. And there's a world out there that doesn't want to hear what Jesus has to say. And they push back against that. But, but it's worth it. It's, it's worth it because we're... We're hanging out. We're not better than other people, but we're hanging out with the one who has it right. We're, we're hanging out the, with the one who saves. We're hanging out with the one who loves. We're hanging out with the one who's, who, who kicks open the door to heaven for everybody. And so, yeah, it, it, Paul is really in a very, very... Second Corinthians is an emotional letter. First mm-hmm. Corinthians is sort of like, I'm a theologian. Here's, here's the stuff. Here's the stuff you're doing right. Here's the stuff you're doing wrong. Mm-hmm. Second Corinthians, you can just feel Paul's like... Mm-hmm. He's really been through the ringer personally, and this is a very personal letter, and that's why it kind of reads the way it does. It sort of it sort of skates around, and so mm-hmm. readers of you are saying, "This doesn't feel like the move movement of First Corinthians." You're right; it's more emotional, where First Corinthians is much more tactical. Mm-hmm. That's helpful. It does read different. It reads very different. Yeah, yeah. And just think of it as an somebody who's been through the ringer emotionally and has mm-hmm. been hurt, and so he's just writing this letter like pouring out his heart, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Mm -hmm. but pouring out his heart to this church. And part of the hurt is due to what the people in Corinth were doing to him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so he... Say more about that. So so that, I mean, he had gone there and he had, you know, started the church. First Corinthians is a response to they'd fallen off the path. Mm -hmm. And then there are people in the Corinthian community that are kind of poking fun at him because they think he's not an eloquent speaker. They think he's poor. They think he's, he's not as influential in their worldly eyes as they think he should be. So they're kind of dogging him a little bit. And so Paul, he kind of he kind of like says to him, he he does this unplanned yeah. visit and he goes, and so the the Corinthian church, they they write back to him and yeah. they apologize. And so this is Paul saying, Hey, hey, we're okay. What what you did wasn't okay, but we're okay. And we'll we'll get to that here in a minute. Yeah, that leads us right into our second mm-hmm. question, Emily. Yeah, what does Second Corinthians chapter one, verse twelve through chapter two, verse thirteen reveal about the Apostle Paul's relationship with the first century Corinthian church and our need to offer Christ like forgiveness for those who hurt us? Yeah, that's a, that's a loaded question uh-huh. that that we kind of are receiving from our Bible readers here. Look, okay, Bible readers and podcast listeners, go to Second Corinthians two verse. Verse one, Paul says, so I decided that I would not bring you grief with another painful visit. Mm-hmm. Now, talk about a loaded Bible verse. Mm-hmm. Unpack that just a little bit. It, does, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, uh, Sheldon, <laughs> to, to figure this out <laughs> by your calculations. But it, what it does is it, it just, let's just take it in its simplest kind of 
the way it's laid out. Paul's saying, the last time I was with you was painful. Mm -hmm. The last time I was with you did not go well. And we know from 1 Corinthians, so he was in Corinth, helped start the church for a year and a half. Then he went to other places, including Ephesus, wrote 1 Corinthians from Ephesus. And then in between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, he had this painful visit. So he write, that means he wrote 1 Corinthians and they, not everybody took it well. Not everybody responded well. Not everybody's like, yeah, well, okay. No, th- th- what, they basically, what they basically were saying was, Paul, we read your letter and we, we just we threw it away. Basically, we, we dismissed it. We think you're wrong. We think we're right. And so their arrogance was still so strong that we talked about on previous podcasts regarding 1 Corinthians. There was also a hint somewhere in here of another letter that Paul sent that never made it into the canon, never made it into Mm -hmm. the New Testament, probably for good reason, because that one, Paul was probably really letting them have it. So I had a painful visit. I sent you a nasty letter. And and now there probably have been some other correspondence back and forth that he doesn't refer to, because now he's more conciliatory. Now he's more, okay, let's, let's, um, let's bury some hatchets. Let's move toward... Let's move toward reconciliation. Let's move toward forgiveness and grace. And, and I think that's important. Well, what else do you guys see in there? Because there's a little bit more. I think it's, it's so hard. Sorry, Anna. Um, it's so hard because for us, we have this way of putting boundaries on this is the place where you can go. So I, I can forgive you for something that you do to somebody else or something that you did to maybe to yourself, but mm-hmm. how could I forgive you for something that you've done to me? And I think that's a, a very clear message to to the church, to all of us, to say sometimes, to use yours or your words, Mike, we, we need to bury the hatchet. We need to get it out in the open mm-hmm. and to do and to, to get the get the grace thing going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For, go ahead, Anna. Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, Christ-like forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean, like Paul set a boundary that he wasn't going to go and visit right. them again. So he set this boundary because he knew it probably wouldn't have been healthy for everyone, right. but he also sent them words of encouragement. So forgiveness doesn't mean everything going back to normal and thinking mm-hmm. that everything's great, but there's boundaries that you can set in place and still love people from afar or love people differently in your relationships. Right. Forgiveness does not mean we put ourselves back in a situation where we're going to get trampled on. Forgiveness doesn't mean Christians become doormats. For, forgiveness doesn't mean that we set ourselves up for that. And so I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up for the biblical balance. It, it really is a biblical balance on that. Forgiveness, however, is not something that we can choose to either do or not do. Yeah. It, that, is a, that is a part of the Christian life. And, and so, right, it might look different. But forgiveness, look at the way Paul puts it in verse 10 of 2 Corinthians 2. When, I, when you forgive this man, because there was some dude in the Corinthian church who was really going after Paul and was going after people who, who agreed with what Paul says, when you forgive him, I'll forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit. But this is the part I want people to notice, so that Satan will not outsmart us. <laughs> what Paul's saying is when people stay in unforgiveness, mm-hmm. like you did something and I'll never let it go, mm-hmm. Satan's winning. It, that that is not the work of God. That is the work of the enemy of God. Mm-hmm. The, uh, C.S. Lewis' great work, Scru- Screw Tape Letters, yep. and one of the things that C.S. Lewis infers in that writing is he basically said that these, there's these two. It takes it from the devil's perspective, and one of the minor one of these devils that's kind of in training says, "Look, all we need to do is get them to turn on one another, and then mm-hmm. our work is done." That's right. Yeah. And so if we can get if we can get Christians to start fighting about something that are the things that are secondary, right. we, don't, we don't even need to work anymore. Yeah. Good thing that never happens. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sarcasm. Yeah. You know, I probably shouldn't go there, but it, I, th- because I mean, I shouldn't go there sarcastically. Let's just go there openly and frankly and just say Christians are not great at that in the world today. Right. Um, in the American church, we, we've become better at fighting with each other. And, in, in, you know, in, it, it's almost, I heard somebody talk about it once as saying we're rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Mm. And, you know, while, while the ship is sinking, we're more worried about who's sitting in the right chair mm. than we are about the, the, the future of the ship uh, and whether or not it's going to make it or not. Um, the Christian church really needs a wake-up call on this. That yes, 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 there's a time. There's, there's a big time. And, and to speak a truth in love and to say, you know, I just don't agree with you on that. And that's okay. 
But are we going to minimize Jesus and say he's not enough to hold us together in unity? Or are we going to say, well, our disagreement is enough to keep us apart as the body of Christ? This is, this is just what the New Testament won't let us do. I mean, if we're going to be New Testament people, if we're going to be Bible people, if we're going to be Jesus people, if we want to make up our own version of Christianity, we do whatever we want. But if we want to have a Bible-based version of Christianity, forgiveness is going to be a part of it. It's going to be essential. And um, it's not an optional kind of like move. It's something we will do. I remember we had, uh, we, our, both of our kids had friends over a couple of years ago. And as our kids had friends over, our, our two kids, they were fighting with one another, fighting, fighting, fighting. Yeah, as and, kids do. <laughs> as kids, as brothers and sisters do. And they get along so well. But in that moment, uh, all of a sudden, both of their friends were like, uh, I need to go home. And so both of their friends leave. And our kids were like, well, why did they go home? And and my wife Bridget and I were like, well, would you want to hang out with you right now? <laughs> and I think when we're looking That's at good. a world that doesn't know Jesus, uh, why would they come? If if we're taking shots at one another, mm-hmm. why would why would we come over? So yeah, mm-hmm. we don't want we don't want to hang out in that house. Amen. Yeah. Paul claims that this letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the Spirit of the Living God. What does that mean, and why does it matter? Yeah. Uh, we see Paul write in paradoxes throughout all of his letters. He's just really good at it. He's very talented in writing yes, in paradox. So when he writes, this letter is not written in pen and, pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Uh, later in that verse, it says, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Mm-hmm. And it just uh, kind of, it's creating a paradox between the Old Testament and the New Testament when the law was written on stones in the Old Testament. But here we see the Holy Spirit coming and writing a new story, a new identity on our hearts. And I think it's really cool. I was thinking about how we see the Holy Spirit in closing worship today. If we were going off of what the law of the Old Testament that was written on stones, we would be missing a whole opportunity to uh, praise God in such a cool way and feel the Spirit move throughout the room. So Paul's saying... The spirit is alive and the spirit is moving and uh, on our hearts. Yeah. I wish people could see, I wish everybody who's out there listening to this podcast could see what you just described, Anna, Mm -hmm. the the closing worship at Vacation Bible School every day or the opening worship. Mm -hmm. We literally have almost every seat in the house taken and probably would have everyone taken if the kids would sit down. (laughs) Um, but, But what are they doing? They're doing what the Psalms say. They're singing, they're dancing, they're shouting, they're clapping their hands. It's all in the Psalms. Mm-hmm. That's how you worship God with every, with your whole being, heart, soul, mind, and strength. They're, that's the spirit, as you say. I'm so glad that you connected that to what we're seeing right now. I just posted on my Facebook page and on Instagram, blessed, blessed are our eyes to see what we get to see mm-hmm. from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus says that you're blessed because when you hang out with me and you make room for my spirit, the Holy Spirit... You're going to see things that you wouldn't see before. I mean, what is it that Jesus said to some of his first disciples when he was calling them? You think it's great that I knew your name, you know, Nathaniel? You're going to see greater things than these. Well, we saw, we're, we're less than an hour away from seeing one of those moments, one of those glimpses of heaven, of the four of us. We we're all in the room. Mm-hmm. A woman came up to me afterwards, who was just picking up a mom, picking up her kids, and she was in tears. And she's a, she's a Jesus person. She's a follower. You could tell. And she goes, I've been in a lot of places all around the world where, you know, it, 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 different experiences of worship, Christian worship mm-hmm. that were really, truly inspiring, that really, truly moved me. And then she's, she's weeping. She's crying. And she says, I have never seen anything like this. I have never seen anything like what I just saw mm-hmm. in our worship center here at Lutheran Church of Hope with thousands of kids over 2,100 today. Yeah, just My today. Because it, it was like 1,800 a few days ago, but they keep mm-hmm. inviting their friends. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, they're, they're doing what the Bible says we're supposed to do. We told them today to fish for people. We should have just said, keep doing what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what they do. They're, they're living out the Christian faith. I, it, it just forces me to say, I mean, maybe this is why Jesus had such a heart for kids. Because mm-hmm. they didn't grow up and learn a bunch of adult things to keep yeah. them from that, that spirit led, spirit-inspired, spirit-filled kind of experience of Christ, not just in worship, but in the way we live, the way we do things. Now, I'm not suggesting every kid who's here is a perfect little saint, because, you know, we talk to them (laughs) before and after, and and there's nothing perfect about any of us, them or me. But, man, God's power through our weaknesses is glorious to behold. And and this is, and Paul's also in for, he's calling back to the prophet Jeremiah, 
prophet Ezekiel, who are saying, like, the Spirit is going to write these things on your heart. And so as we're reading through the whole Holy Bible, we're seeing all, continuing to see all these beautiful connections that don't just connect Old and New Testament, but also connect to our experiences that we're having right here, right now. And everyone will experience, we'll all experience that in many ways throughout our lives. I had this revelation when I was watching Closing Worship today, where I, I have such respect for so many of my seminary professors a generation ago who taught me the faith in the deepest levels, you know, and, 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 and gave me the tools to continue to study and to continue to dive deep and grow. And I'm so grateful for that. But the thing that is, and so I see them as heroes. A lot of them as my theological and doctrinal and and hermeneutical heroes, you know, people who've taught me to go deep in, in my walk with God. I don't know that it gets any deeper than what we just saw. And so there are things mm-hmm. that third graders have mm-hmm. that I'm not so sure those seminary professors all have. I'm not. I don't want to judge and say they do or they don't. But I worshipped with them too in chapel at seminary, and it wasn't like what we just experienced. It, it was not as free. It was not yeah. as spirit filled. It was not. And I'm not just talking about the manifestations, the obvious stuff. It's when the kids are singing from their hearts, there's a quiet prayerful song at the end and there's, they're doing actions to it and stuff. It's just to see thousands of kids doing that all at the same time. That's not to mention the hundreds and hundreds of leaders who are in there mm-hmm. taking care of those kids. And those leaders are getting into it too. It's not just the kids, it's the adults. Yep. Yeah. I just feel like there's something there for all of us that the kids are pointing us to. You know, it's the psalm that a child will lead them and it's the faith of a child that Jesus lifts up. There's really something to that. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, there's things that we learn that deepen our faith as we get older. And maybe there's things we learn as we get older that actually do the opposite, mm-hmm. that we think are deepening our faith, but they're actually pushing us away from that full experience of God in our daily lives. Yeah. I like to tell people it's like seeing joy and having joy in the Lord. And it's not that those kids haven't experienced suffering right. in their own different ways. Like yeah. if you you talk to a few of these Some families, of those kids have quite a lot yeah. going on, but they have that freedom to have joy and praise God in a very free way. And that's kind of contagious for the volunteers it and is. those of us around, which is a blessing. It is because physically it's a little bit exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but true. But, but you, you, I don't want to miss this party. There's no. no way. Yeah. Explain the difference between the old covenant and new covenant that Paul writes about in Second Corinthians three five through eighteen. Yeah. So the the old testament or the old covenant is uh, the covenant that God made. With Moses, and he says, that, and so the the covenant was given to the people, and that covenant was the deal in which how people became right in the eyes of God, mm-hmm. and so it was a way in which to be in relationship. the The challenge with that, as we all know, is that we fall. We we we're we're fallible human beings. We can try our hardest. We can do as much work on ourselves as possible. But this old covenant was uh, was never going to be able to truly set us free for eternity. So this new covenant that we have is through Jesus, through his death, through his resurrection, through the power of his Holy Spirit. And in that new covenant, that new deal, there's confidence, Paul writes about, this confidence that we walk in that assures us that we have salvation, that we have freedom, that we, we don't have to live in fear. And I, and I wonder how many times in life any of us just live in fear of, am I good enough? Mm-hmm. Do I measure up? Am I going to make it? Do I make the grade? Do I make the cut? How many times we do that in our faith? And Paul's saying, there's the old covenant that could induce that. And now there's this new covenant, this freedom of the new covenant that allows us to live in freedom, to live us, to allow us to live and know that we are God's and that he is ours. Mm-hmm. Confidence is a really interesting word. And Paul hits it hard here. It's, it's verse 12 that you referred to, Jeremy. Since this new way gives us such confidence, this new covenant, we can be very bold. We, 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 can, we can push forward with that. The, the older I get, the more I realize my confidence is really misplaced if I'm putting my confidence in whether people think I'm doing well or not. Yep. But my confidence is rightly placed if I'm thinking, I'm pretty sure this is in God's lane. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is inside. And it's not like something I came up with. It's just God came up with it and said, this is where I want you to hang out and this is where I want you to live. If our confidence is in ourselves, which so much of the world, there's so many loud voices out there. Hey, you know, just just have faith in yourself. Just believe in yourself. And I get it. I, you know, we don't have to throw that whole baby out with the bathwater because people can have really low confidence and low self-esteem and all sorts of things that can be just disastrous. Not advocating for that. I'm just saying 
that if we say, well, the whole key to life is I just need to be confident in myself, I think we're missing the real power. The, let's be confident in the God who made us. Let, let's be confident in what God does through us. And that's where we get the boldness. That's where we get the confidence. Paul says, the old covenant ends in death. This is in verses five and six uh, in that range of Second Corinthians 3. And the new gives life. Well, that's a strong statement. There's lots of strong statements here because remember, Paul's writing emotionally, yep. inspired by the Spirit, but he's, he's speaking truths. And he's saying, if your whole entire life is all about you being um, worthy because other people say you are, or you being worthy because you've talked yourself into saying that you are, it won't be enough. Mm. It, you're you're going to hit a wall and it's not going to be pretty and it's not going to end well. But if your confidence is placed in the spirit that you talked about, Anna, just a few minutes ago, that inspires kids to worship in a certain way, well, it's the same thing here. This is the new covenant. It's in Christ now. And you know, later in Galatians, they'll say it's for freedom that you've been set free. You, this freedom is really, really important. And that's now our confidence is in something that really isn't about us. It isn't about, it's not about my performance. It's not about my morality. It's not about my self-righteousness or, or how religious I am even. Now my confidence is in that cross. And that's what Paul's really ultimately getting to. Now my confidence is in, in not what I do, but what Christ has done. His death and resurrection. Well, th- this is a game changer. I mean, Paul is emotionally laying it out and saying, mm-hmm. stop it. Yeah, <laughs> just, that- just stop living for things that because it isn't going to get you where you think it is. You, you gotta, you're going to have to align your life with real power that's going to give you real confidence for the things that are true and are real. Yeah, I mean, and this again, this is exactly what they were kind of making fun of Paul about. They were because Paul they they were trying to do the old covenant deal, mm. and they couldn't understand why Paul would uh, he would live, uh, you know, in First Corinthians nine to those who are below the law. I went below the law. I didn't try to elevate myself. I only I spoke in plain language. Yeah. I didn't try to. I came with you t- with timidity, and they just couldn't deal with that no. because I I'm I'm certain they're like, well, if we need somebody who's leading our church, it can't be him because. <laughs> He's, he looks like he wears a spinny hat, you know, that whole thing. <laughs> yeah. and, and so he's saying, no, look, you're, you're, you're always going to live anxiously yeah. when that's the deal. And I wonder how many of us are living anxiously because mm-hmm. we're living in such fear of whether or not we, we, we measure up. And so these words, they literally jump off the page and give us the assurance to say, I can just be me. Yep. And that's more than enough because of who I am in Jesus. That's the good. old way, the law-based way ends in death. Mm-hmm. The new way, the spirit-led way leads to life. You choose wisely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is going to be good. We are going to go through what you want our listeners to know about some familiar mm-hmm. biblical phrases found in chapters 4 and 5 of 2 Corinthians. The first one is we ourselves are like fragile clay jars. What does that mean? Well, Anna, you talked about it earlier. There's a paradox that happens mm-hmm. and this whole section is all about these paradoxes and mm-hmm. you know clay jars, time of Paul, those things were so fragile, easily broken, easily crushed. And Paul saying, like, we are like that. Like, we're so human. We can't escape our humanity. Yet, somehow, God in his infinite wisdom still entrusted us with the message. That does not make sense. Wait, I always think to myself, if I were God, would I have done it the way that God did it? Mm. Because I don't know if I would have put the message of salvation in people who are human. Like, it just, it seems like it would fall apart. But then Paul says, but look, he did. Mm. And you don't have to be perfect to hold this beautiful message that brings the message of eternity. That's good. Yeah. Next phrase, I think it's pretty common. We walk by faith, not by sight. Love yeah. it. This connects us to another scripture in Hebrews 11, verse 1, that says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So we're walking by faith, not by sight. We're walking by uh, faith in things that we can't see. We walk in faith in the hope that Jesus is going to come and we'll have a full realization one day of Jesus's promises. But until then, we're just walking around in hope. We don't necessarily see new creation around us, but we trust and have Mm. faith that eventually one day we're going to experience it. And we get to long for that day. We get to long for that day with Paul. Um, Thousands of years later, uh, we get to be uh, expectant and excited for that day. Mm. No, it's really good. The the faith that Paul's pointing us to, walking by faith, not by sight, and you said it so well, Anna. He, everything about that and connecting it to Hebrews 11, it's also in the context of these verses about 
death and life again. He's saying the other side of death, that's the context of it, it makes us, we can't see that. So we, we don't have sight for that. We have to have faith for that because we believe in heaven. You know, the, the language, the verse, the way he phrases it here, Paul does in verse six is home with the Lord. So when we're home with the Lord, well, we don't see that now. Mm. We, don't, we don't see it. And Jeremy, when you were talking about the clay jars, we don't see it because we're clay jars. Yeah. You know, we're, mm-hmm. we're, we're messy kinds of imperfect things. You, you really triggered a thought for me, and I'm sure some of our listeners too there, uh, that maybe God should have used more durable jars. <laughs> <laughs> so something that would have been a little more effective, you know, mm-hmm. than they bring out the good china or something. But he didn't. He uses us. He uses us imperfect mm-hmm. people. And in every... So we walk by faith, not by sight, and we ourselves are fragile clay jars because... Uh, it's not about us again. It gets back to that. God's power is made perfect in our weakness. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. Next one, we are Christ's ambassadors. Yeah, I love this one. So we have a a member of our church, Chuck Larson Jr., who's an ambassador, was an ambassador to Latvia, a United States ambassador appointed by a former president. And so I reached out to him, knowing that we we were covering this ground as we were reading. I said, hey, Chuck, tell me what we don't know about being a United States ambassador to another country. And he wrote back, he wrote back a really nice, beautiful, long thing. And I don't have time to cover it all, but I want to highlight a few things. He says, an ambassador is the representative of the president and the most senior official uh, in that country. An ambassador has no legal authority in the country they serve. In this case, it was Latvia for Chuck. Thus, the person must lead and influence by walking in love and being a partner to the degree possible in that particular country. It does not mean that hard conversations do not occur. Hmm. They Mm -hmm. definitely do. But the key, Chuck goes on to say, is to ensure that the host nation understands our policies. So you're an ambassador. You're representing the United States, Chuck was, for another nation. And so when Paul says you're ambassadors, you're Christ's ambassadors, it reminds us of the international nature of the mission that we've been given, that we're called to go to all nations. But it also reminds us that it's not our power. We're not representing ourselves. When we're out there fishing for people, when we're out there being the being Christians, hopefully in our daily lives in an authentic and confident and humble way, it is going to be humble enough to to acknowledge along the way and to remind ourselves along the way, I'm not representing me. I'm representing Christ if I do this right. I'm I'm here to be an ambassador for his policies. <laughs> I'm here to be an ambassador for his way. I'm here to be an ambassador for his kingdom um, and to represent that to others who aren't a part of that kingdom at this time. Chuck also adds this. I think this is so great. He's in, and Chuck is a deeply devoted Jesus guy. It's the, it is the greatest honor to serve as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. For much of my life, a former U.S. ambassador says, I thought a call from the president of the United States and his mission was the most amazing experience I could ever have. Now I know that God's mission, the creator of the universe, has the most amazing missions. And he went on to say... You know, I was reading Romans recently, he said, as we're reading through the whole Holy Bible, we just went through Romans. He said, it hit me for the, for, uh, you know, it's not that he didn't know this before, but it hit him in a very personal and real way. He says, to think that I'm righteous before a holy God. Mm. And you start to realize, okay, all the worldly powers, all the positions, all the status, all the things that we run for, compared to being righteous in God's eyes, which we are through the death and resurrection, it goes back to the cross again, through the death and resurrection of Jesus well, now that's a valuable gift. And so for a former U.S. ambassador to say being an ambassador for Jesus is even better, that's a strong testimony. Yeah. It makes me think about uh, St. Francis of Assisi. Yeah. Preach the gospel at all times. Use words only when necessary. Yeah. You, know, you live that mm-hmm. mission out. Yeah. yeah. And, and Chuck said, so we walk in love. We walk in love. We always walk in love. Whenever I'm out, when he was serving as an ambassador, he says, you got to walk in love, lifting up those in need, which is representing Christ. And so this is saying we're all, we all have that job. Yeah. We do. Paul, thank you for the clarification. Yeah, we <laughs> pastors, we can wander <laughs> off into all sorts of theological things. Thank you, Emily. Yes, you, you, you listeners, people who can see me or hear me right now, uh, us, you are Christ's ambassadors. Mm-hmm. You have this call um, and talk about an honor. And a big job. Big yeah. job. Um, last one for this part is the phrase, today is the day of salvation. What does that mean? What does it mean? I don't know. Well, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to start on this one? We never decided before the podcast. Cool. I'll go ahead and give it a go. Um, 
I think that so often when we think about salvation, we think that it's in eternity. So therefore it's in the future. Uh, and I think that my understanding of eternity has been completely transformed when it was challenged in seminary to think of eternity as this moment on January 19th at 1 35 PM or whatever time you're listening to this. Uh, today is a day of salvation because this moment right now matters in eternity. In eternity. Yes. Uh, this moment is important to God. This moment is important to your relationship with Jesus. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you put that. I think it's the most important part of what Paul's saying here is what you just said. It's salvation starts now. It doesn't start after you die. Most Christians think, uh, well, I'll find out if, if I get salvation after mm-hmm. I die. Mm-hmm. And what Paul's saying is you could have that confidence now. Yeah. You could know that you know that you're saved right now, not because of you, because of Christ. And if you know that, then today is... The, I, just, I just love the way these words, these, these words sing in this verse. This is 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of your salvation. Today's the day. And, I love that. And all of those things that we just talked about, they're all building on one. You're a fragile clay jar, but you, you walk by yes. faith, not by sight, and you're Christ's ambassador. So yes. you, you can see he's like, let's go. Like, it's time. <laughs> yeah. Like, let's go. We told you it's yeah. an emotional yeah. letter. Yeah, read That's it that great. way, yeah. and it'll, it'll make more sense. Okay, how can we find a biblically faithful balance between sharing the gospel with unbelievers on one hand and Paul's call for Christians to, quote, separate yourselves from them, meaning unbelievers, on the other? Yeah, I think that one of the best things that we can do as Christians and as people with a faith, uh, we can love people. We don't Mm. necessarily have to love what they do, and we don't have to partake in the things that they do, but we can love them. And that's one reason why I'm so passionate about sports, and I I get to be a part of the Hope Sports ministry here, is because sports is usually a pretty secular industry, if we think about it. There's not a lot of faith stuff happening, especially if you turn on the TV, the commercials are not faith-based. It's a very secular industry, but then we have people and athletes and coaches and trainers of faith who get to step into there Mm -hmm. as chaplains who get to step into the sports industry, and then they start to change the lives, and they start to change the game, what it looks like, what it means from the inside out. So we don't need to separate ourselves in the instance of, COVID, staying six feet apart, Mm -hmm. Uh, but we, instead of thinking that way, we can be in relationship with them. And we really emphasize relationship here at Hope. We want people to be in community, not because we're all perfect and not because we all agree, not because we all look the same, but because that's the best way that we can love people and is in relationships. I think a, a really easy way to think about it is we're in the world, but not of the world. John so, 17. Yeah. So we, we, we live in the world, but we don't need to be of all of the things of the world. It's, it's something that we say to our, our kids all the time. Mm-hmm. Know who you are before you go in. We say that to them before they go to school, before they go to a game. Know who, and so Paul's saying, you know, know who you are yeah. and now go into the world and love the world for the sake of the gospel. This is a, a theme that's current, concurrent with so many of the other things that Paul writes, you know, 1 Corinthians 9. Become all things to all people. It doesn't mean, and Paul even says, I didn't discard the law when I did all that stuff, Mm -hmm. but I did it for the sake that maybe God could save someone through the message that I was carrying into the world in my fragile clay jar. And so I think exactly what you were saying, Anna, it's, it's being in the world. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be separated from it. We need to be a part of it and bring God's light. Don't, you know, don't hide that, that light under a bushel. No, shine your light, bring the light into the world where you see any darkness? What did Paul's words mean then? Well, I think, I think that's a really good question. Mm-hmm. Later in the New Testament, it'll talk about the full armor of God. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe that's a good way to, to think about this because there's, there's a couple of ditches uh, on either side. One is we can become hyper-isolationists as Christians where it's almost cult-like, uh, taken to an extreme where, well, unless you're as pure as we are, you, you can't hang out with us. But there's an opposite danger and most of us don't drive too close to that, but but it's worth noting. Actually, a, a lot of people generationally um, in our world today have issues with this outside the church, but it's also inside the church too. I'm going to sound a little bit, um, I don't know, old. I don't care mm-hmm. uh, because I want to get in the lane with Christ on this. There's a lot of stuff out there in media, in uh, movies, TV shows, video games, um, music, that just isn't worth our time. And it, and it might be good quality, and it might be really popular, and it might be uh, really interesting, 
And I'm not saying, you know, we sh everybody should cancel their TV streaming, you know, stuff or, or that they should never watch an R-rated movie or, or listen to a song that was written by somebody who isn't a Christian. I think, I think that's going a little bit too far the other way. And I don't think Paul would advocate for that, for that in the totality of everything he writes. But in an emotional way here for this church at this particular time, he's saying, you're dabbling in some dangerous stuff. Mm. Um, you're getting involved in some things. It's sort of like my wife and I won't name the show. It's not worth it. But we were watching a show that we used to like a lot and was somewhere around season three now. And we're watching it. And the whole thing just starts to unravel morally. And it, 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 at a certain point, you got to say, am I going to keep supporting this? Mm -hmm. Am I, am I going to keep talking about this and lifting it up as, a, as, as, as something that others should do? I, I'm talking about when I say morally, I mean it normalizes violence. It normalizes abuse. There's so many shows that could be so good, but they're just mm -hmm. so over the top violent. And then you start to think, what is this doing to my spirit? What, yeah. what, what am I taking in here? And is this going to be something that influences me? Uh, and I, you know, and it normalizes heavy drug use. Boy, that happens a lot now mm -hmm. on a lot of, of of programming that's out there. A lot of stuff that gets produced. And Paul's saying very clearly, separate from that. Mm -hmm. You 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 are actually called to swim upstream in a downstream world. You're you're called to go a different way. And sometimes I think we try a little too hard to blend Christianity in with everything else. Now, some stuff's redeemable. Our VBS songs, we take songs that are not Christian, mm -hmm. and we take the music of that, which is neutral, and we, we, we put Bible stories and lyrics on them. We put memory verses from Scripture on them, and they're redeemed. Uh, so I, I'm not the person who's saying, you know, oh, never, ever watch a TV show where there's a little bit of violence. I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying, guard your hearts, mm -hmm. which the Bible will say later. Pay a little more attention to that than maybe you have been in the past. And it's not just what is it doing to your kids. It's what it's doing to you, yeah. adults. It, yeah. it, it's what it's, it's, if you feel like it's starting to influence you and change your view on life in a way that, that counters Scripture, that's not the work of God. That's yeah. the work of God's enemy. Just, mm -hmm. just Paul's giving a caution here, so I'm not going to try to sweep it under the rug and pretend he isn't. He's putting it out there and saying, be careful with this stuff. Don't get too worldly. Yeah. And I hear a lot of people, especially in my generation or my age, say, how do we even do that when we're surrounded by it? And I think that we can actually look to Jesus as a really great example because yes. Jesus was, uh, he was a really great listener, but he also chose what he listened to. Mm -hmm. He also chose um, the words and the wisdom that he received from his friends and what he took into his heart. And then he also chose to go and have silence as well. So what we listen to is our choice. We don't, we don't necessarily need to listen to what's going on in the world. We can choose just as Jesus chose what he heard and what he accepted. That was an Anna drop moment. That yeah. was really, really good that, that he was a great listener, Jesus, but mm -hmm. he chose what he listened to. Um, we still have a call. You mentioned it, Jeremy. We're not in this world, but we're sent into it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now that's weird, but it isn't. So we don't belong to this world. We're, we're called to live it differently. But at the same time, we're not called to lose our heart for the people who make these films or, you know, violent uh, video games or that, that we just say, oh, well, you know, you're out and I'm in and neener neener isn't that great. We have a mission actually to bring Christ to them. We have a mission to point them to a better way. We have a mission. So we can't isolate ourselves completely in some sort of way where we say, well, if you don't get what we get too bad for you, you know, that's, that's going to not, that's not going to be a good thing. You're not going to like it in the end, but we don't care because we don't like you. We have to love you. You know, uh, that's what Christ's ambassadors do is they love the people who are, that's what good missionaries do. You don't go into the mission field and say, oh my goodness. I can't believe that you say things like that or do things like that, or that's, your, that's what you, you practice it is, it, because it's abusive, it's hurtful, it's violent, whatever it might be. Yeah, go ahead and see the violence and don't embrace and condone that. But we have a mission to love those folks and to bring the gospel to them. Absolutely. Um, and sometimes we are those folks. Jesus has gone into the whole world. The sick need a physician, not the healthy. Mm -hmm. So we got to spend some time with sick people too. Mm -hmm. How does Psalm 51, part of our whole Holy Bible in a year Old Testament readings this week, connect with the story of King David and with us? Well, that's a pretty short one, I think. Um, David was um, a mess. <laughs> he, he had an affair with a woman named Bathsheba, 
And the story is saucier than that, and I don't even have to get into it. Um, but now people are going to be digging through the Old Testament to find it. And, and it's, yeah, it's there. We've already covered it in our Old Testament readings. But he ended up in an affair. It turned into a murder uh, of which he was involved. And then he was still the king, and he's just kind of going around. Well, sometimes when you have that kind of power and you get a little corrupt, you don't even notice when you're doing terrible, sinful things anymore. Well, uh, he had a friend who noticed. And, well, God sent his friend to him to notice and open his eyes. And his friend confronted David and said, look, what you're doing isn't good. Um, this, is, this is what happened. This is what the affair led to. This is the murder. This is, this is the issue. Put it all in front of David. And then David writes, and it's rather famous, especially those who grew up in traditional mainline churches. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, but restore to me the joy of your salvation. Talk about an emotional letter. I mean, a, a psalm inspired by the Holy Spirit. David is saying, I messed up. I, I need to be forgiven by my God, by my creator. And I think it's also worth noting just briefly, this is why David remained a leader. Mm -hmm in God's house. And it isn't, mm -hmm. it isn't just because he repented because God let him continue to lead before he repented. And, and yet he ultimately was led to it and he started to realize, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, God, this is who I am and I need you to come and bless it. Instead, I'm going to say, God, um, tell me who you want me to be and who you made me to be. And then when I veer from that, um, I will repent and return to it. That's, that's ma that's mature faith. It's hard. It's really really hard and challenging, but it's mature faith. I, I would I think Psalm fifty one is one of those bookmark things that a lot of people should do. All of us should do because every so often we know we need to come face to face with something. Yeah. And David's Psalm there gives us the words to say, "Create create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Don't cast me away." I mean, that if if you're looking for if you if you're struggling carrying something and you need a place to go 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 there that mm -hmm. those words are so beautiful and powerful good note um final one how has reading the bible this year strengthened your faith anna well it's been great uh, <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad you like it yeah yeah, yeah that's good <laughs> i think uh so for the past three years, like before this year, I had, was in seminary and reading the Bible f academically is very different yes. than just reading the Bible for your heart. Yeah. So for me, it's been very refreshing to just open it up. And there's been moments um, in June, I had a pretty big season of grief and to just open up the Bible and God met me right there. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that I had to be prepared to go into the reading. I didn't have, ha have to have all the right highlighters. Sure. I just got to open it up. And Jeremy, you preached in the beginning of June on Romans 8, yep. where it said, this Holy Spirit intercedes for you. Mm -hmm. And I remember turning to that page that day, the first mm -hmm. time in a while, and God met me right there. And mm -hmm. ever since then, when I don't necessarily have the words or energy to go to God, God comes to me and meets me right where I'm at. Yeah. Wow. Uh, what a powerful yeah. testimony. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. yeah, I don't I don't know how to follow that one other than um, it is the living word of God. And we'll get to that in Paul's mm -hmm. letter to Timothy. And I, I think that, you know, however many times that I've had the opportunity to read through scripture, this has been a daily thing for me. I just that started that years ago. We read through the Bible every year and Every year that you do it, something else just grabs you, mm -hmm. just grabs yeah. you, and you see it differently, and it might be life stages, it might be whatever it is, but you'll, you'll just, all of a sudden, God will, God will speak to you in that, and I think for me, you know, I, I hear people all the time saying, I, well, God speaks to those people, why doesn't God speak to me? And I think this is strengthening my faith, is through God's living word, I, I, I can sense God's mm -hmm. spirit moving within me, and, and speaking to where I am in the season I am. And I just, I just, it's something I hope so many people do myself included that it will not stop this year. Like pick it back up next year. Mm -hmm. Do it again. Amen. There's a, I think everybody can relate to this on a certain level, especially as adults get older, those of who are listening, who are adults, the older you get, the less you can eat certain things. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they just don't sit as well. You can still eat them. They'll still taste good. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying you'll, you'll not feel healthy afterwards. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I'm not talking about like 10 years down the road. I'm talking about 10 minutes after you eat yep. it sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
Scripture is the opposite. Scripture is eating your vegetables. It may not be something you wake up and be like, I'm going to read the Bible today. This is, this is what I'm really hungry to do. But I found about 10 years ago, I changed my diet and I started eating vegetables a lot. And I eat a lot of everything, but a little of everything actually, but a lot of vegetables and fruits. And now I'm hungry for them. I, and mm-hmm. that's that's not all I crave. I still crave, you know, an ice cream cone once in a while. But but I'm because I'm more in the habit of eating healthier food. I long for healthier food. Mm-hmm. And one thing I've noticed about reading the Bible every day this year, in in Anna, you said it so well. I don't think there's been a day in my life for, since I started as a pastor where I wasn't reading scripture. But a lot of times it's reading it for the sake of teaching or preaching or mm-hmm. preparing something or mm-hmm. you know getting something ready. And so you're you're approaching it academically. You're approaching it as a as a communicator, as a teacher. It's different to be the person like you just testified to, who in June was going through a, a difficult time, and then the word speaks to you in a whole. It meets you right where you are, as you said. It 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 comforts. It 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 connects. It lifts up. It encourages. It reminds you you're okay. It reminds you that God's got you. And I've been there. I've experienced that. Reading the Bible like that every day with not just, oh, I need to read this in order to do something with it as a pastor, but reading it just to breathe in, you know, just 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 to soak in it. It's like eating it's like eating good food. And when you eat a really healthy meal, my wife and I joke about this sometimes. She, she's like, oh, like an hour later, she goes, I just feel energized. Yeah, you know, I'm just I'm just ready to go. Well, when you put healthy things in. That's what you feel. That's what you produce. And, you know, the word of God is that healthy thing. Yeah. It's, it's the word goes out. It doesn't come back empty. Second Corinthians or second Timothy three uh, verses 16 and 17 say all scripture is God breathed. We're not just reading a good book. And Anna, I know you read a lot. How many books have you read so far this year? Ballpark? Uh, around 40. Around 40. <laughs> I know it's humbling to be around her, isn't it? <laughs> she, she is like the avid reader on our pastoral staff. For I was sure. an English major. I know. I'm I know. I'm shocked. I, yeah. It, but, but I love the way you do that. And that's you. And that, you know, you go, sister. Uh, I love reading books. You do too. We're yep, both yep. English majors. But there's just nothing like the mm-hmm. Word of God. There, there's just nothing like it for life. I mean, it may not be always what I'm starved for, for entertainment, but it's what I'm starved for, for life. It's what I'm starved for, for direction. It's what I'm starved for, for inspiration. It's what I'm starved for to, to renew that confidence uh, again and, and to correct me where I'm wandering, which happens every time I read scriptures, like, oh, okay, I got to come back, come back, come back. Uh, so we all got a little King David in us. We all got a, some places where we need to to have yeah. our heart mm. recreated clean yeah. Absolutely. and renewed. Um, so yeah, good stuff. How about you, Emily? Yeah. You're, you're reading. Yeah, I am. And I, you know, what I would add is this, is, we're talking a lot about like, this is the living word of God. It will meet you where you're at. For me, being able to do it with everyone really has highlighted that it is one massive move of God mm-hmm. all for us. And that God did all these things. Like even you guys talking about first Corinthians, Paul was doing this. And then this was his reactive one. It paints this big move of God in story, and we still have yes. an opportunity to be in that. Like God is still yes. doing these things. This is the testimony of the people who were back in that time, but we're seeing it in VBS and mm-hmm. all the time around here. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like there's a dot 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 yeah. in yeah. scripture. The yeah. story cool. goes on. Yeah. It continues, and and you may contribute a verse, right? Yeah. The the powerful play goes on as Whitman writes po- poetically, and you may contribute a verse. Uh, for more on that, you can download my sermon from this last weekend. Mm-hmm. But for more on this, the Word of God, uh, the life-giving, life-changing, life-saving Word of God, I invite you to dive in. Join us as we read through the whole Holy Bible together. If you're already doing it, keep it up. It is really an honor and our privilege to read it together with you and to spend some time every week in this podcast and in our sermons to um, to help you, uh, encourage you as you go and and maybe hopefully clarify some things too. We will see you. Uh, one o'clock again next one week. One o'clock next week again because of VBS. Week two will be dressed pretty goofy again. Uh, <laughs> but we'll see you at worship this weekend and find a church near you if you aren't around hope. Thanks for joining us today. Please make sure to like and subscribe on your favorite platform and we'll see you next time. Yeah.